Open your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Joel, the prophetic book of Joel. We're going to go through this little Old Testament book. If you open your Bible about in the middle, you'll be in Psalms or Proverbs. Move a little bit to your right, and you see what we call the major prophets, because they're long. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel. And then after that, after Daniel, there's Hosea, and then Joel, the book of Joel. Mentioning those prophets... For many of them, their life experience was a key part of their message. For Isaiah, his very children, remember we saw the verse in Hebrews when we were in Hebrews, his children were for signs and wonders in Israel. Their names and the timing of their birth were for signs and wonders in Israel. For Jeremiah, the simple act of selling a property to his cousin became a sign to the nation of Israel, and it sheds light on an interesting question in the book of Revelation at the other end of the book. Uh, Let's see, who else? Hosea, his wife's misbehavior, his family tragedy became a key part of his message. For Ezekiel, the death of his wife pictured God letting go of the temple in Jerusalem on the day that uh, it was destroyed, and so on. For so many of these guys, oh, one more, we got to mention Jonah. Uh, Jonah's whole story, the, 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 the message, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown, is, is a small part. His story is the story of his disobedience and God yanking him around. Yeah, literally, God yanking him around. So for most of the Old Testament prophets, their personal life story was a key part of their message. In the book of Joel, it isn't about his life experience. It's about a national and probably even regional experience. And that was something that God prompted Joel to step up and and explain and provide shape and context to. And also, it served as the basis for prophecies about the end times day of the Lord. We'll talk more uh, introductory or background material in just a moment, but right now, would you join me in reading the first chapter of the book of Joel? The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, O elders, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days? Or in your father's days, tell your sons about it and let your sons tell their sons and their sons the next generation. Verse 4, what the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust has eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust has eaten. Verse 5. Awake, drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you wine drinkers, on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion, and has the fangs of a lioness. It has made my vine a waste, and my fig tree splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. Verse 8. Wail like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn, the ministers of the Lord. The field is ruined, the land mourns, for the grain is ruined. The new wine dries up, fresh oil fails. Be ashamed, O farmers, wail, O vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine dries up, the fig tree fails, the pomegranate, the palm also, the apple tree, the trees of the field dry up. Indeed, rejoicing drives up from the sons of men. Verse 13. Gird yourselves with sackcloth and lament, O priests. Wail, O ministers of the altar. Come, spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Verse 14. 
Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and it will come as destruction from the Almighty. Has not food been cut off before our eyes? Gladness and joy from the house of our God. The seeds shrivel under their clods. The storehouses are desolate. The barns are torn down for the grain is dried up. How the beasts groan. The herds of the cattle wander aimlessly because there is no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. Verse 19. To you, O Lord, I cry, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame has burned up all the trees of the field. Even the beasts of the field plant, pant for you, for the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father God, we worship you and we cry out to you and we trust in you and we place our hope in you even when circumstances look hopeless. Lord, we acknowledge that you are in control and that natural disasters are not outside of your control. Even national disasters are not outside of your control. And Lord, when hard things come our way, help us to have your perspective. Help us to put our faith in you. And help us to effectively communicate your perspective to those around us. Lord, as your word instructs us to pray, we pray for those in authority over us. As President Biden has the plague, we pray that you would extend your mercy to him and that you would point his heart toward you. Lord, we thank you that uh, Ryan's family is well and my family is better. And Lord, we pray for others who are hurting within the congregation. And Lord, we pray for others who aren't here today for, for more joyful reasons. We pray that you would protect Jerome and Susie and that they would have a blessed time with family and friends as they are away on a cruise. Lord, thank you that you love us and that you are there for us, and that you care for us and feel for our hardships as we go through them. In Jesus' name, amen. The, the, the background and the information about the book, a lot of times there can be quite a bit of that. We see it here in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. That is what it says. That is all it says. That is all we know about him. We could deduce just from that verse that Joel was a prophet. The word of the Lord came to him. That's what a prophet is. He's referred to in Acts chapter 2 as Joel the prophet. So we can, we can formally apply that label to him if, if, if it was ever in any doubt. And his name, Joel, means Yahweh is God. Okay? The Hebrew scholars aren't real sure what his dad's name means, so we don't even have that clue. And that's how much we know about him. What about the book? Well, one of the interesting questions in any Old Testament prophecy book, in any book of the Bible really, is when was it written? And look again at verse 1. You see all that there is about when it's written in verse 1. Just by comparison, let me share with you a few of the other uh, prophetic openings. This is Hosea chapter 1 verse 1. The word of the Lord which came to Hosea the son of Beeri during the days of Uzziah, etc., etc., etc. See that? Stay open to Joel chapter 1 verse 1. Here's another one. This is Amos 1 1. The word of Amos was among the sheep herders from Tekoa which he envisioned during the, during the days of Uzziah king of, Israel, of Judah and the days of, Re of Jeroboam and so on. One more and you get the picture. Micah 1 1. The word of the Lord which came to Micah in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and so on. What is not in Joel 1.1? Any, any clue about when the book happened? So, 
Bible students, and there are many of them, have looked through the book of Joel and picked out this clue or that clue and tried to fit it in to what we know of the Old Testament historical timeline. And you know what? They're all over the place. There are those who argue for an early date. There are those who argue for a date right before the fall of Jerusalem. There are those who put it at the very end after they return from Jerusalem. I lean towards the early date, but you know what? The text doesn't say. If we needed to know when it was written to understand and apply it, God could have told us, right? So we will study it and apply it and try to apply it to our lives without shoehorning it into one spot or another on an Old Testament timeline. Let me give you just, just, just one reason why I kind of lean toward an early date. Where is it in the book? It's in between Hosea and Amos. Those were both early prophets. Did the ancient rabbis and the ancient scribes who put the scroll together have an idea of when it was written? I, I, I trust their judgment. And that's just, just one reason. But uh, we can't be dogmatic about it because the text isn't dogmatic about it. What is the book about? We just read chapter 1. You get a good feel what it's about. It was about a devastating combination of circumstances that wiped out Israel and Judah's crops to a point where people were starving. A combination of circumstances. The key one was, of course, the locusts. But as you saw down at the end of the chapter, there are a couple of more events that happen in that same time frame. So this circumstance was happening. And Joel, God's spokesman, stepped up to provide context, to provide shape, to provide God's perspective on what was going on in their day. And in chapter 2 and following, to use the tragedies of their day to look ahead and preach about the coming day of judgment. Joel preached about the present problem, and he predicted the future judgment. Today we're looking at the present problem, and the title I put on this message is How to Respond to Hard Times. In the first seven verses, he described in detail the devastation in the chapter. And he's expressing what they should do about it. He's also expressing God's perspective on it. Later on in the chapter, we'll highlight a, a key truth about who God is and how he operates. Actually, a couple of them. But Joel is, among other things, a poetic prophecy. This is Hebrew poetry. It has lots of, of literary lines, literary themes tying it together. Uh, for example, he talks about the four different kinds of bugs. According to the omniscient internet, there are 98 kinds of locusts in the world. Aren't you glad you knew that? Is he talking about four kinds of locusts? Very possibly. Is he talking about the four stages in a locust's development? I think probably. But in any case, he highlights that. And you see, you see the, the, the poetic but also tragic sequence there in verse 4. Another thing that kind of uh, highlights through the whole chapter is all the different crops he mentions. If you count them up and, and assume that the oil is talking about olive oil, which it was, and the palm is talking about the date palm, which it would, would have been, if you count them up, there's somewhere around eight or nine different crops mentioned or alluded to in the chapter. That's just one of those things he sticks in there to tie the whole thing together. It's a poetic, a literary device. One more interesting thing, and the one that I will highlight as we go through it, is he addresses his challenge, he addresses his lament, he addresses his instructions to mourn to different sets of people. 
And in, a, in one case, uh, one singular person, it's a singular, a singular verb, and we'll talk about that. Different sets of people. Who are the first ones that he's addressing? Verse 2. Hear this, O elders, the leaders of the land, and listen, all inhabitants of the land. He addresses the leaders and through them everybody. In the middle of verse 14, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land. And that's the first thing that we notice as far as who he's talking to. And we'll highlight the other ones as we go on down. The next one is a little bit amusing. Beyond that, after getting their attention, what's the first thing he challenges them to do in verse 3? Tell your sons about it. Let your sons' sons and their sons, the next generation, let them tell the next generation. My friends, this book is a book of history. Yes, there is a lot else in here. But among other things, this book is a book of how God has dealt with his creation from in the beginning, to even so come Lord Jesus. This is a book of history. History matters. Recording history matters. Having your history for your children's and their children's generations matters. Why? Because seeing how God has operated in the past is very, very relevant to us to understand how he operates now, God doesn't change. God hasn't changed. My son is a journalist for a political news site in Virginia. His, his main beat is Virginia state politics. He lives in, uh, on a suburb of Richmond, the state capital, and he's writing about state politics. <clears throat> Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. A few years ago, during the previous governor of Virginia's tenure, the whole focus on the gov in the government of Virginia and the local city government of Richmond was to destroy all their best tourist attractions. On the main drag, on the main boulevard, down through the historic portion of Richmond, Virginia, at every other intersection, there was a big traffic circle with a plaza in the middle of it and a statue of some Confederate hero or other. They tore them all down. The last one to go was General Lee. General Lee, they had to go through a bunch of extra hoops and court cases to get permission to tear him down. They tore down all their tourist attractions. They tore down all their history. Why? Well, again, Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. There's a certain aspect of that history that's really, really negative. So they decided, get rid of it all. All right, that's a political decision by, uh, by, by some folks back on the other end of the country. And yet, that tendency to eliminate and uproot history and rewrite it is going wild in our nation. My friends, God cares about history. God cares about truth. Throwing history overboard is just a subset of the whole issue of throwing truth overboard that we're seeing elaborated on and lived out in ridiculous ways and to ridiculous extremes. Here the prophet appeals to the people to consider their history and to record the history they were going through for future generations. And that's part of the reason we can read the book to get today is because they wrote it down. God cares about truth. God cares about true history. And uh, those of you who sat into my teaching a lot know history is one of my hobbies, but I won't, uh, won't chase that any further. The uh, next 
statement we already talked about a little bit, verse 4 and following, the different stages of bugs, the different stages of locusts. Here in Arizona, we know something about bugs. Here in Arizona, it seems like every month there's a new bug that comes through, and they're predictable. I'm glad fly season was pretty short this year, and yet fly season was extra bad for us this year because I have three dogs in my yard, and I don't even own a dog. You'll hear that complaint again later. At the height of fly season, I went down to Home Depot and spent 30 bucks on fly catching products. Three weeks later, I can record to you that we have caught about four flies with that 30 bucks. <laughs> Ah, but uh, we're talking about locusts, not flies. Flies were, were one, of the, one of the plagues of, uh, of Egypt. We're talking about locusts. In a couple of months, and you all that live here know this, in a couple of months, you won't be able to drive on any of our local roads or highways without crunching giant grasshoppers under your tires. I remember one year they were really bad, and we'd been up to Luna Lake, and when we came back, the whole under, underside of the vehicles was coated with, with crushed grasshoppers. The typical red locust that they have in the Middle East, and by the way, it is still an ongoing problem. As recently as 2020, they had a big locust plague, and the pictures that I'm showing you today, I got them off Wikipedia, are from 2014. They, they still have locust plagues. Where was I? The standard locusts that they have in that area, they call them red locusts. They're only red in one phase of their development is about the size of the big grasshoppers that we'll see out on the road. Their bodies are about three inches long. They're not, as near as I can tell from the pictures, they're not as fat, they're not as big around as the, uh, the locusts, that, the, the grasshoppers that, that cross our roads. But they can swarm in enormous clouds, and they come out cyclically every so many years. So every so many years, there's one year where several strains of them come together, and then there's just enormous amounts of them. A few years back in Ethiopia, there was a locust plague, and the UN got involved in everything else. And they had four DC-7 water-dropping tankers flying over Ethiopia, dropping malathion. Can you picture that? That's the modern way of responding to this problem. They didn't have any of those possibilities. They just watched them devour their livelihood, watch them devour their food. Still with, the, with that picture of locusts up, I've got one or two more to show you. An interesting thing about locusts in Moses' law, kosher food laws, locusts were good to eat. If they devastated your crops, at least you could fry them and eat them. I'm not, I'm not really making a tie into that, but have you noticed how the media is flooding us with stories to accommodate us to the idea of eating bugs? How many of you have seen those stories out there? I, I will try to uh, put a shape on that one. <laughs> Let's go on and look at the next target of his, 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 his speech. Verse 5, Awake drunkards and weep, and wail all you wine drinkers on account of the sweet wine. Awake, hey, it didn't, there we go. Awake wine drinkers. Frankly, when bad stuff goes down, the drunkards don't notice. They've had bad stuff in their lives to the point where they are drowning it out. But when there's nothing left to drown it with, they'll notice. It's interesting to notice in our largely socialist economy now, who is hit first 
by an economic downturn. The wealthy aren't touched. The poor have a cost of living allowance added to their government money. It's the middle class that get hit. The poor are the last to get it. It's one of the ironies of modern nations that our poor class are the most obese class. Think about that. But moving on, here he addresses the drunkards. says, you guys need to wake up and start worrying because there's nothing left for you to drink. Something else is not tied to a specific line in a specific verse here, but notice that there is no suggestion of a human solution to the problem. There's no suggestion of a human source of the problem. The locusts came. I don't know how crop insurance works. It seems like it might be a little bit differently. But in terms of ordinary insurance, something like this would be called an act of God. The locusts. They didn't have a person to blame. And they didn't have a person to look to for solutions. Part of where we are as a nation today is that our, distra- our, our tendency is to be distracted by the individuals that we blame for the problem. And I'm not going to go there, but you, you probably already have in your head who you're blaming for national problems. And we tend to hope in human solutions. We have an election coming up. By all means, fulfill your right, privilege, and responsibility as a citizen and cast a prayerful, informed vote. But you know better than to expect the politicians to be your savior. Ain't going to happen at any level. Best we can hope for is things might get a little bit better. Here in their situation... They had no hint of an earthly solution. Sometimes the prophets gave them earthly solutions. Elisha was given a vision by God that there was going to be a hard time. There was going to be a drought. So he told his host family, this would be a good time to go visit some other nation for a couple of years. It's going to get rough around here. And they did, and it did, and then they came back, and God restored what they had before. God will sometimes point us to practical solutions. But there's not a hint of that in here. You uh, think it's a good idea to, 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 to prep or any of those things? By all means. But the solutions that Joel points us to are all on a vertical plane, Pointing to God. There is a note of hope, even in the, 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 the description of the devastation in this chapter. Read with me again verses 6 and 7. Remember, this is God speaking through Joel, the word of the Lord that came to Joel. God speaking, verse 6. A nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion. It has the fangs of a lioness. It has made my vine a waste and my fig tree splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. Do you see the the, the note of hope in God's message of devastation? Even though God obviously has sent this judgment, this destruction, and we'll come back to that point later on in the chapter, God is still viewing Judah and Israel as His land. It's His vine. It's His fig tree. Looking at moral and cultural decay, an economic decline in the United States of America. 
I don't think that same term applies at all. I don't think that God looks at the good old USA and says, this is my land. You've heard me say it before. Biblical prophecy is not USA-centric. It's not America-centric. And yet, do we belong to God? Do you belong to God? Your problems are His problems. And we can come boldly into the throne of grace and receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. We saw that verse in Hebrews 4 when we were in Hebrews. It's God's land. God cares. Whatever hardship you are going through, God sees it and God cares. God cares for those who are suffering. That's the message all through Scripture. God identifies with the underdog. It's the way he describes himself all through Scripture. It's God's land. So the first, the first instruction God through his prophet gives to the people is to take notice. Look around you. See what's happening. Well, we'll talk about that a little bit. What is happening in America today? Economic decline, but it's tempered a little bit for us here in eastern Arizona. We can be grateful for that. Yes, the price of coffee took a precipitous dive. But then it leveled out above 320 a pound, and it's picked back up a tiny bit. At 320 a pound, those of you who are employed by the mine, and those of us who are impacted in a local community economy by the mine, at 320 a pound, we're still, we're still okay. We're not going to be the poorest county in Arizona. We're not going to be the poorest county in America. Things are going to be okay economically. What about culturally and morally? My friends, you know where America is. Can we cry out to God for the cultural and moral devastation in America? We not only can, we should. The command is to take note, observe, acknowledge the situation. Let me balance that out and temper it a bit. I remember years ago uh, 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 scolding an older gentleman who, uh, he was a military veteran, among other things, who spent his time sitting in front of the TV watching Fox News and tearing what little hair he had left out by the roots about the fact that the nation he'd fought for was going, you know where, in a handbasket. And it's like, get off your couch, get out. You've got a really nice hobby. Go chase your hobby. Don't spend your time wallowing in the problem. And we'll look at the next stage of the solution in a moment. So the first instruction is to observe and also to lament. We've already seen some lamentation. Then in verse 8, there's an interesting little change in the, in the passage that isn't, um, isn't specifically highlighted in our English text. You know what? I'm, I'm sort of running ahead of my notes, so I'll, I'll wait till, till, till we're getting there to make, to make that point. We are to lament. Verses 8 through 13 are all about lamentation. Verse 8, wail like a virgin girded with sackcloth. And I'm wailing because my device just died. There we go. Wail like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. Verse 9, the priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. Be ashamed, verse 11. It's talking about mourning. And you see the verse there from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. My friends, this is something that sometimes we lose. And I'm talking especially about us guys. In our culture, there really isn't any culturally appropriate way for men to express mourning. In certain subsets of this culture, I've seen at funerals, men express mourning by getting drunk. I hope that's not your subculture. Our tendency 
particularly as guys in our culture, is to be in denial. You know what it was like when you were an eight-year-old on the playground and a, ten, a big ten-year-old knocked you down. What were you supposed to do? Bounce back up and say, that didn't hurt. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The first step in receiving God's comfort is to acknowledge the problem and to mourn. By the way, mourning is also the appropriate response to self-satisfaction. I was down here yesterday sitting in my office in my desk down there. I had this uh, the, the sermon outline done and I took a time out to have a bite of lunch at my desk, um, and then I was going to go back over the sermon outline one more time to proofread it one more time, and that final proofread never succeeds in catching everything, and there's a, there's a, there's a glitch in it if you look close enough. Don't bother to look now. So I'm at my desk having lunch before the final proofread, and um, I click to a, a news site, political news, and lo and behold... There's a headline with a picture of a cross beside it. Wretched indeed. I'm looking at that on a political news website. And I click on it. And it's one of the editor's testimonies. And the, the interesting setup to that testimony is discussing one of the popular TV preachers and his affirmations. Let me read for you some of his affirmations. Quote, I am prosperous. I am successful. I am victorious. I am talented. I am creative. I am wise. I am healthy. And in this article, the contrast was with the Apostle Paul when he said, Oh, wretched man that I am. And the author's testimony was, when we acknowledge our wretchedness, it's when God lifts us up. This wasn't in that article I happened to run across while I was finalizing this sermon, but I was reminded of the other passage in the New Testament where that English word wretched is used in the King James. It's the only place where the Greek word, the only, those are the only two places where the Greek word is used in the New Testament. And it's in Jesus' letter to the self-satisfied Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3. Jesus speaking, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, and have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I advise you to buy from me. Oh, I went too far. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, and white garments so you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus' harshest words in the Gospels were reserved for the smug and self-satisfied. My friends, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And the next verse I already had up there is from James, talking about how we should respond. Submit ourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Verse 10, the promise. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. And he will exalt you. My friends, the, the command through the chapter, particularly this middle portion, is to mourn the situation they were in. We don't have to wait for things to get to starvation level 
to pray over America. We don't have to wait till we hit bottom to get right with God. Do it now. In going through the, the, the different addressees, the different people or individuals, groups or individuals that the prophet addresses, there's an interesting one in verse 8 that's a little bit veiled by our English texts. In verse 8, he's still addressing different groups, only this time it's not a group. All the other places where it has the command to wail or to mourn are masculine plural. Addressing with, with masculine verbs a group of people. And of course, masculine is the generic. Masculine is for everybody. But here in this one verse, verse 8, he uses a singular feminine command. Singular feminine verb. He is addressing a specific young lady and instructing her to mourn. I'll read the verse again, and then I'll make just a suggestion of who that person might have been. Wail like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. You're familiar with the Old Testament. You're familiar with the Psalms. You're familiar with the prophets. Who is often referred to as the virgin bride? The city of Jerusalem. No, the church is New Testament. The city of Jerusalem, the virgin bride. Perhaps that's who he's addressing here. Maybe he had somebody in mind. Maybe he knew a woman who was betrothed and had lost her, uh, her, her fiancé. In any case, it's, it's an interesting note that out of all these the groups that he addresses, he addresses this singular feminine individual. He goes on and talks about the priests. Verse 9, the priests mourn, the ministers of the house of the Lord are mourning. Verse 13, spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. First part of verse 13, lament, O priest, wail, O ministers of the altar. Then the next people he tells to lament, the priests, the ministers. And he specifically points out the people who were the first victims. Verse 11, be ashamed, O farmers. Wait, wail the wine dressers for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. And he goes through there with those other, other crops. The, uh, the palm would have been the date palm. Date palms were a big deal with them. When I was going to graduate school, I lived with my grandma. And, of course, my grandma had lived through World War II and could uh, talk about the, 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 the hardships and privations her son, my dad, was in the tail end of World War II. But um, during World War II, all the chocolate and all the candy and all the sweets and most of the sugar were sent to the troops overseas. And my grandma got in the habit, which she never got out of, of eating dates. They weren't rationed. You didn't have to have a ration card. It was candy that grew on trees that you could buy and eat. And, uh, you know, uh, 40 years later, she's still eating dates, date palms. Another interesting note about the crops there. The word translated apple, they're not real sure of. It could be apple, could be apricot, something else. But anyway, the farmers were to wail. Notice one more note the prophet brings in here. In the end of verse 13, he wails for the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. In verse 16, food has been cut off and before our eyes there's no gladness and joy in the house of our God. I'll, I'll, I'll share you another picture. This is locusts in the creeping stage before they can fly. When hard times happen, do we only consider it for how they impact ourselves? Do we ever take the time to put ourselves, in a sense, uh, on, on God's side and think about how the tragedies in America are affecting Him? The tragedies in the world are affecting Him. My friends, does God care when His name is blasphemed? 
when the family which he created is torn apart and redefined. Do we ever mourn for the impact on God? The prophet instructed them to mourn because there weren't any offerings left for the temple. We should care about what God cares about. A guy named Steve Cohen, a uh, Messianic Jew, was the best man at my wedding. And he had a prayer that I've heard him pray often. It was, uh, Lord, help me to wail and moan for the things that cause you to weep. The last paragraph of Joel 1, we get down to his specific instructions. And the instruction is to cry out to God. But the first stage of that, read verse 14. Consecrate a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land of the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. Note that the first command is to come together. Communal prayer, praying together is powerful. And God instructs it all through His Word. It used to be standard in our nation in times of distress that the leaders would call for a national time of prayer. That's how we have the holiday of Thanksgiving. A time where the leaders call us together to thank God instead of sorrow. Now it's uh, all about turkey and football. My friends, Coming together to pray is powerful. And what kind of prayer? Crying out to the Lord. In verse 14, we are to cry out to Him, lift our responses to Him, share our desires, share our feelings, share our pain, share our hurt with the God who can do something about it, with the God who cares. Cry out to the Lord. Again, in verse 15, he talks about the impact of the, the problem on, on God's worship. There's an interesting note in verse 15. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm dependent on the, the helps and the, uh, the, the computer programs for studying the Hebrew, but they are very helpful. And there's an interesting note, a deliberate play on words in the Hebrew in verse 14. How many of you like puns? How many of you are good at puns? I like puns. I don't know that I'm very good at them. The Hebrew language lends itself to play on, plays on words. And let me draw that to your attention in an area that you're, you're, you've observed. Notice all those stories in the Old Testament where this, that, or the other happens, so the mother names her newborn with this name. And we look at the name and we look at the event and we can't see the connection. The connection is they sound the same. They sound the same. They sound alike words in Hebrew, and the, the language is set up for sound alike words. My friends, there is a pair of sound alike words in verse 15 that are sobering, but we need to see them because they tell us a key truth about God. In verse 15, Verse 15, let's read the verse. Alas for the day, the day of the Lord is near. It will come as, look at that last phrase, destruction from the Almighty. My friends, the word destruction is the Hebrew word shad, and the word Almighty is one you've heard in praise songs. It's the word shaddai, el shaddai, el shaddai. The prophet, the inspired prophet, is making a connection, making a play on words between the destruction that came from God and the fact that God is all-powerful. Remember, God is the one who's going to wind this ball of dust up and torch it at the end times. Read Second Peter. God's power, God's sovereignty, God's almightiness. We worship. We should also recognize that that's tied into His ability to destroy, to judge. Verse 15 is also a look ahead at the next chapter. It mentions for the first time the day of the Lord. 
The day of the Lord is the coming judgment, and we'll talk about that in the next couple of chapters. For now, let's finish looking at the, the details in this chapter, their present story, their present problem, not the future judgment that was coming. I don't watch a whole lot of movies. I have not watched this one. I'm not telling you whether it's good or bad. It's just sort of an interesting one that I have to know a tiny bit about because it was, it was a big deal one time, and I'm interested in things that have to do with the sea. Some of you undoubtedly watched the movie The Perfect Storm. Right? About everything going wrong for a fishing boat out at sea and uh, the three different kinds of uh, directions of wind coming together until... If I understand correctly, and again, I haven't seen the thing, it did not have a happy ending. In this story, if you look at the details, particularly at the end of the chapter, we find that the God's chosen people, God's promised land, was assailed by a perfect storm of land-based agricultural devastation. Besides the locusts, there was drought and there was fire. Verse 19, flame. Verse 20, drought. And it also mentions drought earlier on. My friends, they were facing starvation. None of us really have a clue what that's like. We can't identify. I don't wish it on anybody. I'm not predicting nor hoping for that in our culture. But the command to cry out to God would have been very vivid to them in their circumstances. I see Alan put a battery in the clock. I was almost hoping he wouldn't notice the clock was dead. I will still take the time to, 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 to tell what a funny tidbit. Last night, we had a real gully washer of a rain in Thatcher. Um, it, I think it rained pretty good over here, but it really rained over there. Again, I have Carissa's dogs in my backyard. <laughs> now, they have a nice enclosed patio, but the rain starts coming down. It starts coming down harder and harder. We're listening to it beat against their bedroom windows, and... Carissa got up and went out and took her dogs into the house, right? No. Carissa lay in bed and snored for all I know. Kim got up and went out and ushered two wet and muddy dogs into the house. Why do we have to deal with it? Uh, I know there's no animal lovers in our congregation. This, this doesn't relate to any of you at all. Um, Notice God notices the pain of the animals. Verse 18. How the beasts groan. The herds of cattle wander aimlessly because there's no pasture for them. Even the flocks of sheep suffer. God cares about animals. I mentioned Jonah earlier. You know what the last word in Jonah is? Animals or cattle or livestock, depending on which uh, translation you have. God cares about animals too. Jesus said a sparrow doesn't fall without God taking note of it. One more note. In verse 14, he challenges the people to corporately cry out to God. And then in verse 19, the prophet personally, individually cries out to God. To you, O Lord, I cry, for fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. We as a congregation, God's people overall, nationwide, worldwide, will continue crying out to God corporately in different settings as God calls us together. Each one of you, cry out to God personally. If you don't know God, that's the first step. Cry out to Him. Commit to Him. Ask Him to reveal Himself to you. God created you for relationship with Himself. Jesus died on the cross to purchase the ability for you to relate to Him. Cry out to Him to reach out to you. 
At the beginning of the chapter, I mentioned that the prophet spoke up to provide a, a, a godly perspective, to provide shape and context to the situation they were facing, to the tragedy they were facing. That's the prophet's job. To some extent, that's the preacher's job. Although I preach mostly from the book, I don't preach from the newspaper. It's also all of our jobs. We need to be providing context to the people around us. Godly context for the things that are going down. It can be as simple as praising God for the rain. We've had a good monsoon season this year. When someone mentions the weather to you, give God the glory. And when someone mentions to you a problem, local or national, you don't have to respond on the level of politics. Respond to the level that God's in control and we're trusting Him no matter what. Or if it's a personal problem, respond by asking if you can pray for the person. Jesus gave us an example in Luke chapter 13 of responding to the current events of His day. The current events of His day were a massacre by the Roman governor and a tower that had fallen in and killed the people that were in it. And his response was, you don't suppose those folks were worse sinners than anybody else, do you? No, unless you repent, you shall all perish. My friends, part of our response to hardship should be personal repentance. When bad things go down, don't just weep, wail, and mourn. Cry out to God and respond to Him. Would you pray with me, please? Our Father God, thank you that you are sovereign over every circumstance including the ones we don't like that come our way. Lord, in every circumstance, good or bad, the good times test us as well. May we be near to you. May we be focused on you. May we be humble before you. May, remember, may we remember to cry out to you. Thank you for the prophet Joel and uh, the record that uh, you preserved for us. I pray that the vivid picture and the lesson that's in this chapter would motivate us to turn every circumstance to an opportunity to cry out to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's benediction is in the last paragraph of Psalm 144. May our sons and our youth be as grown-up plants, and our daughters as corner pillars fashioned for a palace. May our garners be full, furnishing every kind of produce, and our flocks bring forth thousands and ten thousands in our fields. May our cattle bear without mishap and without loss, and may there be no outcry in our streets, O oh Lord. How blessed are the people who are so situated. How blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. Be our Lord, we pray. Oh, thank you. God bless. Go with God.